You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. Jack, a bunch of doggone heroes. Every doggone one of us. Oh, oh, look here, Doc. Yeah, I know how you feel, Reggie. I wouldn't believe it myself. Only here it is, spread over the front pages of every newspaper in the country. <laughs> you believe everything you read? Well, of course I do. A newspaper wouldn't dare print anything that wasn't true. <laughs> Doc, you haven't done a thing but read those papers since they were taken on at San Francisco. Darn interesting reading, too. Look at this picture of me. Doc Long, the modern Tarzan, who slew a mountain lion with his bare hands. All right, Tarzan, fold up the newspapers. <laughs> what do you mean, fold up the newspaper? Stop reading that stuff before you begin to believe it. Remember, Reggie and I have got to go on living with you. Well, what's that got to do with it? You keep patting yourself on the back, and you're going to break your arm, and we're going to have to feed you again. Hey, you know something that makes me kind of mad? I thought you weren't mad at anybody. Well, looky, we took on a new stewardess at San Francisco... And she ain't even give us a tumble. Well, why should she? Why, a pretty girl like her, she'd ought to be interested in a bunch of he-fighters like us. Oh, yeah. Now, look, Doc, you bored the other stewardess from Seattle to San Francisco with your story. Will you let this girl alone? Oh, all right. Of course, if she asks me, I'm going to have to tell her. Well, she won't ask you if she knows what's good for her. Doggone, I can't get over. The insurance company are giving us 25,000 potatoes. Just for bringing Alexander Archer back alive. 25,000 good round simoleons. It was little enough. Richard Cooper had killed Archer, the insurance company would have been out a million. Yeah. And now here we are on our way to Hollywood to live like three doggone kings. I still don't know why you wanted to come to Hollywood. Well, Hollywood is good as any place else to spend 25,000 smackers, ain't it? Yes, I suppose so. But, Doc, uh, we really don't have to spend it, do we? Of course we do. What good's 25,000 if we don't spend it? Mm -hmm. You agree with him, Jack? Well, it's certainly true that he won't be good for anything else until the money's gone. Mm, quite. And it is a bother. Oh, it ain't gonna be no bother to me. <laughs> Not for long, it ain't. What's the best hotel in Los Angeles? Oh, there's several. Yeah, but the most expensive. I don't know. Well, anyway, that's where we're going. Yeah, but, Doc, we're not dressed for that sort of thing. Then yeah. we'll get dressed for it. And we'll get the most expensive automobile we can find and eat in the most expensive eating places and go to the most expensive shows. And the 25000 will last us just about one month. Well, that's just about right. I don't think I could stand being so darn expensive much longer than that. <laughs> Do you like it, Reggie? Well, as a matter of fact, I don't. Now, there's gratitude for you. I work out a swell way to spend our 25000 Well, just think, Reggie, folks are waiting on us, breakfast in bed, waiting uh, waiting around in pretty women up to our armpits. I was wondering when that was coming out. <laughs> pretty women? Yes. But, Jack, that's the best part of the whole idea. Why, there ain't nothing I like... We know there isn't anything you like as much as a pretty woman. Well, they ain't. There's one thing, though. I'm just wondering with so much whoopee of... I'm going to be able to get home every morning in time to have breakfast in bed. <laughs> Look at you fellas. Promise me something? Well, let's hear it first. I want you two to promise me, no matter what happens, no matter what, you get me, that we ain't going to take no adventure nor solving a mystery nor nothing like that until until every last penny of the $25,000 is gone. I see. You don't want business to interfere with pleasure. You bet I don't. You promise? Well, now, that's a funny thing to ask, Doc. Adventure just doesn't come up and smack you in the face. You've got to go out looking for it. Yeah, but I know Jack. He smells something, and away we go. But if we do run into something... No, sir. If we run right smack into something, we're going to turn our backs and start walking the other way. Well, what do you say to that, Jack? I say the worst is about to happen. Huh? Well, what do you mean? That stewardess has spotted us. She's coming this way with a newspaper in her hand. Hey, that's all right. Well, get ready, Reggie, to hear the story of our great adventure all over again. Mm, quite. Hello, honey. Are you Mr. Long? Oh, that's all right. Just call me Doc. Oh, I see. Then this is your picture in the paper. Yep, that's right. And, uh, these other two men... Yep, Jack Packard and Reggie York. Oh, but it's wonderful. 
You're the three who were almost murdered and fought those mountain lions. Yeah, w- would you like to hear about it? Dog. Oh, please. And that poor girl, Linda Joyce. You were wonderful to save her from the mountain lion the way you did. Oh, shucks. It wasn't nothing. Uh, sit down a minute, and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, will you please do? It's his pleasure. I know what that? I say you don't know what you're letting yourself in for. Hey, Jack, she asked me, not you. That dreadful Richard Cooper and Dr. Thorne. Thank goodness they're safely in jail. Yeah, they're locked up so tight they ain't never going to get out. But there were so many of them. I mean, beside the two leaders. How did you ever get off the island? Well, while me and Linda was out fighting the lion, Jack and Reggie here captured Cooper and Thorne and locked the rest of the gang up in one of the rooms down in the cellar. Oh, you two should be so proud of yourselves. Hey, uh, what about me out there fighting the lion? Yeah, but after all, you did have a knife. It wasn't a very big knife. And anyway, I've heard that mountain lions are cowardly. <laughs> hey, when I got through with that cougar, I was in the hospital for two weeks. You don't look like you'd ever been sick a day in your life. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, I swear to Grandma, I ain't never seen a girl like you before. Ain't you impressed at all? Of course I am. The way Mr. York and Mr. Packard locked up 13 men single-handed... I think it's wonderful. Yeah, but maybe you don't understand about mountain lions. Mr. Packard, what happened after you locked those men up? Well, we found Alexander Archer and, and loaded him into the launch with Cooper and Thorne and brought them into court for us and turned them over to the authorities. Oh, but what about all the men that were locked down in that underground room? Oh, the police went out the island and got them. Well, well I suppose you know you're famous. Well, newspapers have to print something, I suppose. But I still don't see why they made so much of Mr. Long and the mountain lion. Hey, look, are you just plain trying to make me mad? Why, no. Of course not. Well, whether you believe it or not, fight, fighting mountain lions ain't no child's play. Oh, pooh. My folks live on a mountain ranch up in Washington. My mother scares mountain lions out of her chicken yard by shushing her apron at them. Hey, that ain't so. I beg your pardon. Well, hey, I, I didn't mean to say that. I, I'm sorry. Don't only... apologize. I shouldn't have come back here. Yeah. Yeah. But my mother did too scare mountain lions with her chicken apron. So there. <laughs> Well, what are you two are sitting there grinning about? Too bad Cooper didn't argue with a kitchen apron instead of a knife, Doc. All right, all right. So it's funny. Now I come to think of it, Reggie, I wonder if maybe Linda didn't scare that lion to death by shaking her skirts Yes, yeah, quite. But in that case, how did Doc get those scratches and bruises? He might have fallen down a ravine. Yes, that would account for it, all right. Well, you two guys shut up. Well, naturally, he couldn't say that Linda killed the cougar. Naturally not. Look, are you two smart guys. I beg your pardon? Yeah. I'm a passenger on the plane. Well, so what? You look like the fella whose picture I got here in my paper. See? Oh, okay, so I'm the fella. What about it? Is it true you killed the mountain lion with your bare hands? No. You think? But it's right here in the paper. I can't help that. Then that mountain cougar still alive? No, he ain't. He died of being scared to death. My goodness, you don't tell me. Sure I'm telling you. My mama come along and waved her kitchen apron at him, and he laid right down and kicked the bucket. Young man, you're a liar. Oh, you don't believe me. That's a fine way to talk to a gentleman. Well, if you don't believe me, just go back and ask the stewardess. She knows all the answers. Are you a gentleman, this feller's companion? <laughs> yes. What's the matter with him? Well, he hasn't been quite right ever since we left the island. Ah, oh, so that's it. Too bad. Too bad. Why, that <laughs> gum, you jack. <laughs> Find a pair of sippy cats as I ever tied up with. Don't worry, Doc. There'll be a new batch of newspapers with stories in them when we reach Hollywood. Well, don't you say newspapers to me. Oh, look here now, Doc. I'm warning you. The first newsboy that sticks a newspaper under my nose is going to get smacked right back three generations. <laughs> oh, I say, look down. Lights. You must be getting in. Passenger safety belts, please. No smoking while we're landing. Passenger safety belts, please. So your mama shushed a cougar with her apron. Yes, she did. First thing she knows, she's going to have herself believe in that. Oh, talk. <laughs> yeah, we're heading into the field. Well, there we are. Back on solid ground again. Well, there she is, folks. Burbank, California. Come on, let's get out of here and start spending some of that money. What do we do? Take a taxi? Please, doggone right. To the most expensive hotel in Los Angeles. Some place that's close to Hollywood, though. Watch your step, please. Watch your step, please. Your mama sure enough scared a cougar with her apron. You're holding up the passengers. Please move along. Oh, so you're backing down there. I am not. 
Well, Doc, come on. Well, all I got to say is that your mama's one tough home. Oh, you're impossible. Take his arm, Reggie. I'm a coming. Watch your step, please. Cute kid. Just as soon lies. Look at you, though. Quite a crowd outside the gate. Grant's got a little plane ready, getting ready to go out. I beg your pardon. Are you Mr. Jack Packard and party? Yes, that's right. This way, if you please. Yeah, wait a minute. Who are you? I'm the chauffeur. If you'll just get in that big black car over there, I'll pick up your baggage. Man, oh, man. Looky at it. A block long. Well, what's it all about? We didn't order anyone to meet us. You must be mistaken. You said your name was Mr. Packard. That's right. Well, then, if you'll please get in the car, I'll, I'll be right back with the luggage. Jack, I don't get it. Well, neither do I. Well, what do we care? Looky, it's what's in that a big old automobile. What's that? I ask you, did you ever see a prettier arm full of girl than that? No. Let's climb in. What are we waiting for? Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. Don't we get ourselves in the most expensive places? Looky, Jack. Looky, Reggie. Silk sheets, even. All right, silk sheets. So what? So I'm going to sleep between silk sheets for the first time in my life. Honest to my grandma, fellas, if my cousin Winnie May could see me now. What makes you think we're going to be here long enough to sleep between any kind of sheets? What you mean? We've been brought here, ain't we? I still think there's been some mistake. I say, Jack, what's that? Huh? Oh, where have you been? Oh, prowling a bit. Did you two know there's a suite of three bedrooms with separate baths? Well, didn't I tell you this was expensive stuff we got ourselves into? A bedroom for each of us. Sure, so what do you mean, Jack, by saying it's a mistake? Well, there's no sense to anything that's happened so far. We get on a plane to come to Hollywood for the express purpose of spending $25,000. Well, we can spend it from here just as good as any place else. Well, that's not the point. Ain't, huh? No, it isn't. The point is, when we get off the plane, we're met by a liveried chauffeur in a fancy car, just as though we were expected and being met by appointment. No explanation, nothing. We're just invited to get in the car. That's right, and so we get in the car. And why? Well, because there's a good-looking girl waiting sight inside for us. Well, that's as good a reason as any for getting into a strange auto. Are you sorry you did it? Well, look what it's got us in so far. Yeah, but that isn't the idea, Doc. We've been driven out to this beautiful old Hollywood mansion, and we don't know why. All we know is that this is the home of Randolph Martin. Yeah, whoever he is. And that these are to be our quarters, and the dinner will be served at seven. Hey, well, we know the name of the little old honeypot who met us at the airport. Faye Martin. Does that mean anything to you? No, of course not. <laughs> Except I like knowing it. Why? Because I think I'm going to like Faye when we get to know each other better. You're out of your class, Doc. What you mean, out of my class? If this house is any indication, the Martins are not only wallowing in money, but they're overflowing with the refinements and niceties of an old family. Aristocrats? If you look about, you see signs of the family tree almost everywhere. You mean we're going to be high-hatted? What happened in the car on the way out here? Huh? Well, what you mean, what happened? Why, the minute we began asking Miss Faye Martin questions, she froze solid. Yeah, only I just thought she was kind of nervous on account of us being strangers. Besides, you don't think I ain't man enough to unfreeze her? <laughs> well, you still don't get it, Doc. She was the uh, little princess keeping the village yokels in their place. Well, then what'd we come for? Oh, oh see here now. No, Doc. sir, I'll be doggone if I'll stay around folks who don't think I'm as good as they are. All right, Doc, relax, will you? 
The whole point is that we allowed that girl to bring us from the airport to this house without getting one bit of information out of her. We allowed ourselves to be turned over to the butler in the downstairs hall and conducted to these rooms, still not knowing what it's all about. And now we've been here for an hour, and what do we know? Well, I'll tell you what we know. What? We know that we're being neglected. That's what we know. Yes, and that's about all. Well, why don't we do something about it? We don't have to stand around with our teeth in our mouth. We ain't locked in. Let's bust out and find this here Randolph Martin. No, that's not the answer. Well, why the heck ain't it? Well, don't you agree with me, Reggie? Get aggressive and show them that we ain't folks to be pushed around. Mm, no, no, I, I don't think so. Hey, what's the matter with you two anyway? Oh, look here, Doc. Gentlefolk might not understand our strong arm methods. Gentlefolk? People of breeding. Refinement. Hey, look, you think I'm purdy enough to sit down at the table with these folks tonight? <laughs> oh, look here. After all, we didn't come here of our own accord. They brung us. Now, just the same, Doc. I think we can wait until dinner. Oh, sure, we can wait until next week. But that ain't spending none of that $25,000 reward money we've come to Hollywood to spend. But we're bound to meet the whole family at dinner, and then the reason for our being here, if there is a reason, will come out. I say, who is this uh, Randolph Martin, anyway? I never heard of him. You, Jack? No. No, he can't be anyone. Oh, someone showing some signs of interest. Well, how doggone gracious of him not to forget us completely. I get it. Hello. Oh, good evening. I'm Jack Packard. Look. Somebody slashed me. Slashed you? Yes. Here, on my arm. Here, let me see that. Well, maybe you better come in here. Yes, I guess maybe I'd better. And you're bleeding all over the carpet. Come into the bathroom and hold your arm over the basin. All right. Reggie, close the door. Quiet. I say, Doc, did you see that? Yeah, what's going on here? What's she mean, somebody slashed Well, you? she was belly well bleeding. Well, who the heck suppose she is? Oh, Doc. Yeah? Bring me some iodine and cotton and some adhesive tape out of my bag. Okay, uh, coming right up. It isn't really very much of a cut. About an inch long, not too deep. Now, how'd it happen? They did it. They? Yes. I was walking down the hall. And I felt a kind of sharp sting on my arm. I looked at it quick, and it was all bloody. This happened just now, out in the hall? Yes. Who was out there with you? I turned around real quick, but there wasn't anybody. Here's the stuff you wanted. No, thanks. Hmm. They don't amount to much with blood washed off. But how'd it happen? They did it. Well, you keep saying they. Who are they? I don't know. They just won't let me alone, is all I know. Yeah? Well, what did bothering you for? I don't know. I think they're trying to kill me. Kill you? Hey, wait a minute. What did anybody want to kill a nice girl like you for? I don't know. Now then, this might sting a little. I'm pouring iodine in the cut. I don't mind pain. Good girl. There it is. A little cotton and some adhesive tape, and you're all well again. Oh, look here, Jack. Didn't you hear her say someone's trying to kill her? Yes, I heard her. Do you mind telling us your name? I'm Cherry Martin. Cherry, huh? It's really charity. But nobody calls me that. Then you must be the sister of Faye Martin, who met us at the airport. Yes. She likes Faye best, but her name's really Faith. There you are. Now come out in the other room. You're still pretty much upset. No. I'm not upset. Well, then why that fearful whisper? I'm afraid they'll hear me. Please sit down. No. No, I mustn't. I must go now. But see here, I think you should sit down and tell us about this if you're in danger. That must be the reason why we're here. Yes, that's part of the reason. But I must go now. But ain't you scared to go out in that hall? If somebody got to just slashing your arm, ain't he liable to do it again? Yes. Then why not stay here where we can look out for no, you? No. I mustn't stay. Well, why? I just mustn't. That's all. Would you like someone to walk to your room with you? No. I'm all right. Oh, yes, I almost forgot. Hope is my other sister. I say. Faith, hope, and charity. Yes. She's the one who's in the worst danger. Hope and my brother, Job. Your sister, Hope, and your brother, Job, are in the worst danger? Yes. From what? From whom? I don't know. But they do. I'll see you at dinner. Well, smack me for a baby. What goes on? Well, now things are beginning to make sense. The reason for our being here begins to emerge. Danger, murder, fear. In this house? There's your blue-blooded aristocracy you fellas was holding your breath over. Oh, it's more apparent than ever, don't you think, Jack? I mean, to say the exquisite refinement of that girl's face. The roots of an old family tree are firmly entrenched in this house. Yes, Reggie, but it's also apparent that the family tree is beginning to show signs of decay. Signs of decay? Looks to me like it was rotten clean down to the roots. Mm, something's belly wrong, all right. Screw a family in the beginning. Who ever heard of naming girls Faith, Hope, and Charity? 
Sounds like a Texas camp meeting. Well, at least we know this much now. There are three sisters who've gone to the names of Faye, Hope, and Cherry. And there's a brother, Joe. Yeah, there's another name out of this world. And it appears, according to Cherry's story, that someone is molesting her with the intent eventually to kill her. Yeah, and right in this house, too. Funny kind of a cut she had on her arm. What kind of a knife would make a thin, long cut like that? No, Dr. Scalpel, safety razor blade. I say, that's exactly what it looked like, a safety razor blade cut. Yeah, but who's going around murdering folks with an old safety razor blade? What do you do with your old safety razor blades? (laughs) But this must be pretty doggone serious, Jack. Cherry thinks they're out to kill her, yet she says her sister Hope and her brother are even, in even worse danger. I'd, I'd like to get hold of that Randolph Martin and give him a piece of my mind. His children are in danger, and he keeps us up here waiting. He doesn't tell us what it's all about, and he, why doesn't he let us get onto it? Did you ever stop to think... Listen. You say, a blooming infant in the house. Yeah, then one of the girls must be Mary. Open the door, Doc. Well, what for? Ain't you never heard a baby holler before? Never mind, open the door. Okay. All I hope is he don't yell at night. Has a fine pair of lungs. Stuffed a nipple in its mouth or something. Jack, I say, come on, what are we waiting for? Here, here's the stairs. And there she is lying down at the foot. Come on. Oh, doggone. Here, wait a minute. Straighten her out. Uh, Oh, hey, it's Jerry. Is she dead? No. No, she's not dead. No. I'm not dead. Well, hey, she, she's conscious. And after a tumble down all them stairs. All right, what is it this time? Oh, hey. Well, why are you all standing there gaping? What is it? Your daughter just fell downstairs. My granddaughter, you mean. Is she hurt? No. No, I'm not hurt. Oh, falling downstairs. I didn't fall. Somebody pushed me. Hey, they, they did? What's that bandage on your arm? Somebody slashed me. <laughs> Can you stand? Yes. I think so. And get to your feet. Here, uh, l- let me help you. Uh, huh? There you are. Thank you. Perhaps I should explain how we happen to be here. I know more about that than you do, young man. You do? I should. I brought you. Then you're... Randolph Martin. And I need help. I'm having granddaughter trouble. <laughs> Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. Packard, we'll go into the library. Mrs. Martin, will you tell me why you sent Doc and Reggie back up to our quarters? I'm taking you into the library to meet my granddaughters. What's that got to do with Doc and Reggie? My dear man, you don't know my granddaughters. What's that? No. When there are too many eligible men about, it's difficult to get them to concentrate on anything else. Man crazy, huh? Keep a civil tongue in your head. <laughs> you suggested it. I can say what I please about my granddaughters. You can't. I see. Be sure you do. 
the Martin girls can do no wrong. But you were telling me a few moments ago you were having granddaughter trouble. I am. Well, isn't it going to be a little difficult for us to discuss the trouble if I've got to assume the attitude they're above reproach? I'll do the criticizing. Your job is to correct the trouble in this house without comment. Aren't you being a little high-handed, Mrs. Martin? You're questioning me. I certainly am. First, you practically kidnapped me and my two partners. You didn't have to come if you didn't choose. How did you know we were arriving by plane at Burbank this evening? Read it in the paper. But did you stop to consider that we might have had plans of our own? They weren't important. You mean they weren't important to you? I'm afraid you're a woman who's used to having her own way. I'm afraid I am. Well, you go right ahead and have it. Well, I think Doc and Reggie and I will be on our way. Fiddlesticks. What's that? You're staying right here. Against our will? Nonsense. You're staying here because you're needed. You're asking us to stay? I'm ordering you to stay. Now then, I'll say goodbye. Don't be a fool, Jack Packard. We don't take orders. You walk out of the house because I order you to stay instead of ask you to stay. That's right. You'll be well paid for obeying my orders. Keep your money. As a matter of fact, our one purpose in coming to Hollywood was to spend our reward money from the last job. It would melt faster down here than any place we could think of. You don't recognize authority, and you have no use for money. That's right. You're difficult young men to handle. Not at all. We enjoy doing favors. The House of Martin does not accept favors. Now, that's up to you. For generations, we've been able to pay for anything we want. In my opinion, then, the Martins have wanted few of the good things in this world. Bah! Well, there we are. We can't agree, so we'll go. No. Yes. No, wait a minute. Well? I don't like it. I'm not used to asking people to do things. But I will. I'm asking you to stay and help me, Mr. Packett. Please? What's that? You didn't say please. How dare you? Don't if you don't want to. Young whippersnapper. <laughs> Mr. Packard, will you please stay and help me? Gladly. In fact, we'd already made up our minds to stay. I think you've got an interesting problem here. Hmm. What do you know about the problem here? Nothing. But it's apparent there's something. It's in the atmosphere. Something, might I say, something creeping through this house. Creeping? Creeping? A creeping, unhealthy menace. What are you talking about? I don't know. You don't suppose it would be the stench of a decaying family tree that's permeating the environment, do you? Oh, such utter nonsense. We spent enough time. Come along in the library and meet my granddaughters. Very well. <laughs> decayed family tree, indeed. Only a suggestion. Uncalled for. Come on in. Yes. Now then, Faye... Where is Hope? Oh, Grandmother, whoever keeps track of our beautiful Hope? Hmm. Well, someone should. I hate to be the one assigned to the job. I told her to be in the library at eight. Grandma, I know where she is. Cherry, shut up. Faye, please, you're a Martin, and that Martin women are always ladies. Oh, horse feathers. The Martin women are always ladies. Now then, Cherry, where is Hope? She sneaked out with the chauffeur again. You little rat. Faye. Well, she is. I am not. Hope should leave the chauffeur alone, and you know it. Well, that man will get his walking papers tonight. <laughs> Let's see. That'll make the fourth chauffeur to get his bounce in three months. We'll not discuss the subject any further. Mr. Packard. Yes? This is my oldest granddaughter, Faith Martin. Sure. We met before. Yes, I think I've had the pleasure. What's that? Miss Martin was in the car that met us at the airport tonight. You were? Why? I just wanted to get first look at your private detectives. I don't particularly like that term, private detectives. Well, isn't that what you are? Three flatties in plain clothes to keep an eye on the Martin girl. That will be enough of that, Faith Martin. And, uh, look, Packard. Grandma's the only one who can get away with Faith. Make it Faye or don't talk to me. I remember. All right, you've had the center of the floor long enough. You know Charity Martin already. Not Charity, Grandma, please. Cherry. Miss Cherry Martin. Any bad results from your fall downstairs? <laughs> don't tell me Cherry fell downstairs again. I didn't fall. I didn't. <laughs> I was pushed from behind. And when you looked around, there wasn't anyone there. How can you look around when you're falling? Hey, let your sister alone. If she keeps falling down the stairs much more, we can make a tumbler out of her and put her in the circus. Faye. <laughs> okay, why not? Miss Martin. You'd better call me Faye. There are too many Miss Martins around this joint. Very well, Faye, then. You don't seem to take your sister's convictions that someone is trying to kill her very seriously. Oh, Cherry's just got a persecution complex. I have not. Sure you have. You're always talking about them being after you. They want to kill you. They. What's that but a persecution set up? Perhaps. But how do you account for the marks of physical violence? That's not in the mind. <sighs> You've got me, pal. But if there's anybody in this house chasing Cherry with malice aforethought, then 
I'm a flagpole sitter. Faye, I find the vulgarity of your language exceedingly distasteful. <laughs> Poor Grandma. She's tried so hard to make ladies of us all. And what did she get? <laughs> well, what did she get? You really like to know? Faye, watch your tongue. I assure you I would. I'd like to know very much. Well, I'll start with me. I'm the oldest. Yeah? I'm the vulgarian of the family. Faith Martin, you mind what you say? Oh, go lay down, Grandma. You begin to understand, Mr. Packard. You see why I need help so badly? Go on, Faye. You're the Bulgarian. Correct. Hope is the family wench. Witness her evening escapade with the chauffeur. Faye, the family name. What family name? And Cherry, the little whispering mouse here. Uh, she's just a plain dope, afraid of her own shadow. I see. That's the way you analyze the situation. That's us. Here we are. Look us over. What about Brother Job? We'll not discuss Job. He's a fine young man. The only one in the family who appreciates the name of Martin. Um, that's Grandma's version. Want to hear mine? Please. Brother Job is a good-natured drunk. Hey. Who's been taken by every jip game Hollywood can think of and is slowly breaking his grandmother's heart. If I may offer an opinion, I don't think you girls are doing your grandmother's heart any good either. Oh, well, she doesn't love us. As long as we don't get the name of Martin in the headlines, she doesn't mind us, but she loves Job something awful. We all do. We all love Job. And he's in such danger. He and Hope are in terrible danger. Yes, you said that before tonight when I was bandaging up your arm. Bandaging her arm? Hello. You have got a bandage on, haven't you? What happened? Somebody slashed me as I was walking down the hall. What? It's true, it's true. You... You mean somebody slashed you with a knife right here in this house? Honest, Faye. Honest, they did. And, Mr. Packard, do you suppose there really is somebody after her? There's evidence to indicate it. Look, Mouse, maybe I've been doing you an injustice. It's true enough. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's take that up later. We've got away from our subject. Oh, yes, which was Job, the family drunk. You say he's in danger, Cherry. What sort of danger? I don't believe there's any truth in it. Who'd want to harm Job? Besides, the child's been forewarning doom for members of the family for years. But he is in danger. He and Hope. What sort of danger? Danger out there, outside the house. But it's getting closer. It's getting closer all the time. It's creeping. It's creeping. Cherry, stop saying that. I think that's the expression I used before we came in here, wasn't it, Mrs. Martin? Yes, and I forbid its use again. Well, at least Cherry and I seem to have the same intuitive sense of impending danger. How nice for Cherry. What do you mean? That you and she have something in common. I wonder if you couldn't find something in common with me, too. Such as? Well, I like my initials embroidered on my pajamas. I don't wear pajamas. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> then you'd have to have your initials tattooed on your chest, wouldn't you, <laughs> Mr. Packard? Yes? I forbid you to indulge in conversation of this nature with my granddaughters. It seems to be the only language Faye understands. I forbid it. You know, Mrs. Martin, you seem to dominate everyone and everything except your grandchildren. Why is that? I can tell you why. She did dominate us when we were little and couldn't help ourselves. She made such hateful little prigs out of us, it was shameful. You were nice children. You bet. Nasty nice. And then one day, Job found out about fire water, and now he's devoting his life to it. And one day, I found out that there are some wonderfully disgusting words in the English language for self-expression. I'm devoting my life to them. And Hope discovered chauffeurs, and she's devoting her life in that direction. And what about Cherry here? Oh, poor little mouse. She hasn't discovered much of anything yet, so she's devoting her life to being afraid. I am not. I'm not afraid. If they weren't always after me, I wouldn't ever be afraid. They have been after her for a long time. But uh, now, if they've come to life and are starting to cut her up, it may be getting serious. Yes, I'm beginning to wonder. By the way, are any of you girls married? Married? I should say not. Is Job? Certainly, Job's not married. Then who's the parents of the baby we heard crying earlier? Baby crying? You heard a baby crying? Certainly. Just before Cherry here fell downstairs. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? It's impossible. What are you talking about? There's not a baby in the house. There hasn't been for years. But I've heard it. I've heard it. So she says. Yes. And every time it cries, something horrible happens. <laughs>
further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. I'm telling you, the more I see of this setup, the more I wish we'd gone on about our own business. Jock, that isn't like you. What ain't like me? Why, here we are guests in a millionaire's home with three beautiful girls and only their grandmother to watch over them. And what a grandma. Boy, I don't like her. (laughs) Doc's had it in for Grandma Martin since she sent us back up here to our quarters right after dinner. Yeah, what'd she do that for? She think you're the only one in our outfit good enough to associate with the Martin family? I can tell you why. Well, I wish you would. She said she wanted me to have a serious discussion with her granddaughters, and if there were too many eligible young men in the room, the girls wouldn't think of anything else. Did she really say that, Jack? She did. And when I said man crazy, she jumped all over me. Well, these just plain ain't the kind of girls that I want to associate with. Not from what I've seen of them. She ain't got nothing to worry from me. Well, they have money. And so have we. 25,000 bucks reward money. And what I want to know is why we don't ditch this joint and get to spending it. That'll have to wait. Yeah, on what? On the solution of the trouble that's breaking about this old grandmother's head. Well, that ain't our hard luck. I'm afraid it is. Now. Why? Because Mrs. Martin's begged us to stay and help her out. I say, that haughty, stiff-necked female aristocrat begged you to stay here? That's right. So you can see how desperate she must be. But what's the matter? What are we supposed to do? None of it makes much sense yet. I've got some tangled information. You want to hear it? Naturally. Now, throw me that other pillow, Reggie. I don't. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Well, come on. Settle down and let's have it. All right. Well, let me give you a picture of the people in this house. Oh, you've seen them all now. No, I've only seen Grandmother Martin and two of the girls, Faye and Cherry. Faye described the others. First, Faye, or Faith, is the eldest. She describes herself as the Bulgarian of the family. Oh, I say. The, the what? Bulgarian. She shocks her Puritan grandmother every time she opens her lips. On the other hand, I have a good idea that she has more gray matter than all the rest of the family put together. Mm, good looking? Yes, apparently all the Martin girls are extraordinarily beautiful. Well, that's Faye, the Bulgarian. The next girl is Hope. Hope wasn't in on the conference tonight, although she'd been told to be there by her grandmother. Yeah, where was she? Sneaked out with the chauffeur. Hey, I say, one of the Martin girls? Yes, according to Faye, this will be the fourth chauffeur to lose his job in three months on account of Hope. Faye's name for Hope is the family wench. Well, no wonder Grandmother Martin is upset. Faye, the Bulgarian, Hope, the family wench. And now we come to Cherry. Quite. And, uh, what is Cherry? Well, Faye calls her Cherry the Terrified Mouse. Hey, that ain't so bad. She ain't spoke above a whisper since we come into the house. Uh, are they still after her? Well, there's no doubt that she has an obsession that someone's after her. But it looks like with good reason. But you you, uh, you you mean you think somebody in this house really is trying to kill her? Well, I don't know whether they're trying to kill her, but they certainly are keeping her in a continual sweat of terror. In what way, Jack? First, slashing her arm. Second, pushing her down that flight of stairs. Oh, Grandma didn't take that very serious. And neither did Faye at first. When she heard it, she said, Oh, so the terrified mouse fell downstairs again. Again? Yes, yeah, looks like it was a common occurrence. But then I put in my two cents worth and scared the living daylights out of both Faye and Grandma. Well, what'd you want to scare them for? I didn't mean to. It wasn't until after I'd said it and saw their reaction that I knew it meant anything. Well, come on. Uh, what did you say? I said I heard a baby crying just before Cherry fell downstairs. Who does it belong to? Well, what's so terrifying about that? Whose infant is it, Jack? And uh, where's the nursery? There isn't any nursery. And there isn't any baby. Why, Dad busted, Jack, there is too. We heard it. There isn't any baby in this house. You, you're being serious? I, I mean to say, we did hear it. Well, Jerry's been hearing it for some time now. She says every time the baby cries, something terrifying happens. You mean a baby's haunting this house? I don't mean anything of the kind. Then what do you mean? I don't know. I'm just stating what I've heard. Cherry's been complaining of hearing a baby crying in the house and that every time she hears it, something vicious happens. The rest of the family have laid it to delusions. Oh, but see here, Jack, what we heard was no delusion. That's just the point. That's what frightened Faye and Grandma. 
The fact that we heard the baby proves that Cherry hasn't been talking through her hat. Doggone. Who ever heard of a house being haunted by a baby? Rubbish. Well, there it is, ain't it? A baby's voice and no baby. It's a plot. A plot, huh? Well, didn't Jack just get through saying that the kid cried just before something bad happened? Mm, That's what that girl Cherry says. And what she says is true on account. Look, we heard the baby cry, and then right after that, she was pushed downstairs. Quiet, I grant you that. Well, okay. You mean to tell me whoever's doing all this is running around this house with a baby in his arms, uh, pinching it to make it cry just before he gets ready to to do some of his dirty work? Well, that's pretty silly, though. Of course it's silly. That's just what I'm saying. Besides, there ain't no baby in the house. So what? So it's got to be a baby ghost. Oh, for the love of Peter. Well, it has, Dad, blast it. A baby ghost in this house on account of there's so much trouble and so many things is wrong. And every time that something else starts to go wrong, it, it it tries to warn folks by crying just before it happens. Beautiful theory. Well, you think of a better one. Why? Okay, okay. The trouble with you and Reggie is that you wouldn't know a ghost if he'd come up and... And, and laid and... an egg in my hat? <laughs> That's just plain vulgar. <laughs> Why? Because ghosts don't lay eggs. Oh. Well, they don't. All right, all right. Now, do you want to hear the rest of my story? Well, what about this baby cry? That's all there is. You know as much about it as I do. And that also brings us up to date on Cherry. Oh, Cherry, the uh, terrified mouse. Hope, the family wench. And Faye, the Bulgarian. And the last on our list is Joel. Mm. Oh, that's brother, huh? Yes, in age he comes between Faye and Hope. According to Faye, he's the one who's breaking Grandmother Martin's heart. Mm. And uh, has Faye a name for him, too? Yes, Joel, the good-natured drunk. Drunk, huh? And what does Grandmother Martin say about that? She tried to keep his name out of the conversation, said he was the only one worthy of the family name. Faye, on the other hand, says he's never sober and has been taken by every crook and confidence man in Hollywood. Just a never-end and easy mark, huh? Looks like it. And Grandma's always paying out and covering up for him, for the good of the name of Martin. Oh. When are we going to meet him? I don't know. When he comes home, I suppose. Well, where is he now? I tried to find out. No one seemed to know. Faye suggested some night spot with a well-stocked bar. I say, nice boy. Ah, company. Sit still. Listen. What's the matter, Jack? Nothing. Just wait. I say, whimsy. I get it. Hello. Why, you little wench. Oh, you've been talking to Faye. Reggie, toss me a blanket. What's that? A blanket, a blanket. <laughs> Not a wet blanket, I hope. No, just toss it. There, I'll put this around you. You don't like me this way. No. They cost a lot of money at the best shops. Okay, so they cost a lot of money. Now, come on in. Why didn't you like them? Handmade and imported French lace. Now, keep that blanket around your shoulder. Here, sit down. What's it, Amy? <laughs> I almost sat on the floor. Drunk again. <laughs> Don't tell Grandma. I never had a drink in my life. Oh, that's queer. No smell of liquor on her breath. She's as sober as we are. I say, Jack, who is this? Who am I? Yes. No, no, wait. I'll give you a clue. I'm not Faith and I'm not Charity. Now, who am I? Your hope. That's right. Why'd you knock on our door if you don't know who we are? I saw a light. Thought I ought to investigate. In long black stockings and a wisp of lace? Imported French lace. Where have you been? No, no, no. Mustn't tell. Scandalous. Ruin the family name. Out with the chauffeur, won't you? Shh, don't let Grandma hear. Come on, now you're not drunk. Where's your dress? <laughs> I said, where's your dress? What dress? Look here, Hope. You want me to shake your shoes off? Where did you leave your dress? You didn't want me to wear a dress with blood on it, did you? Hey, what did you say? Of course not. Nobody wants to wear a dress with blood on it. It's ugly. It doesn't match the color scheme. Hope, listen to me. What kind of a dress were you wearing? Slip-on, slip-off dress. I always wear slip-on, slip-off dress. I mean, what was the material? What color? Green. My favorite color. Green flowers. Now then, where'd you leave it? <laughs> Slipped out of it in the dark downstairs. Tossed it to Bob. Bob's a good egg. He'll get rid of it. Nobody ever find it. Who's Bob? Best chauffeur Martin family ever had. Is he home? Did he bring you home? Yep. Bang, bang. Man shot dead right across our table. I got blood on my dress, so Bob says, quick, let's get the ten-letter word out of here. <laughs> I always say ten-letter word for swearing. Doc, Reggie, I want you to go down and find the chauffeur. I don't. Bring him here? If you'll come. Anyway, get Hope's dress back. Uh, Jack. Yeah? Look, look at her right leg. Mm-hmm. There's something on her stocking. Looks like blood, all right. There is. Here, keep that blanket on. <laughs> Unfasten your stocking. Let us slip down. Oh, naughty. Crazy little fool. There's been murder. Do you want the evidence splattered all over you? There, that's better. 
Well, what are you two standing there for? Well, if, if Hope could tell us where the chauffeur's quarters are. Chauffeur's quarters? Over garage. Chauffeur's quarters always over garage. Right, oh, come on, Doc. Yeah, okay. Hey, hey, what's that? Listen. The baby. The baby. The baby. The baby. Stop that. Jack, there's just got to be a baby in this house. <laughs> Jack, I say. <laughs> which way that scream come from? Down the stairs. Down the stairs. Well, come on. The baby, and, and then something happens. Down the stairs, this way. The baby, and then something happens. The baby just and then something happens. Something happens. Oh, there she is. There in the chair. I say, who is she? Mrs. Fay. <laughs> Fay. Fay, what's the matter? Up, up there by the hall entrance. He's dead. He's dead. Dead? Who's dead? The chauffeur. The chauffeur. And he's got Hope's dress. All over with blood. <laughs> Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. People are so dead when they're dead, aren't they? Not a very suitable sentiment for the occasion. No, no, don't touch anything. <laughs> hey, who is the Bulgarian Martin, they call? What are you doing? I'm trying to discover if there are any clues in the vicinity of this corpse that might implicate any member of the Martin family. You want to implicate one of us? No, but I want to know what we're up against before the police arrive. Why not the Marines and the Navy? The police have to be called, you know that. Why? You can't ask sensible questions, don't ask any. Whoever shot this man must have used a silencer. Otherwise, we'd have heard the shot. Mm, a good-natured drunk has a gun with a silencer. Your brother, Joe? Mm-hmm. And I still want to know why we have to call the police. Murder's the policeman's business. Not this murder. This is the Martin family's own private little bloodletting party. You think someone in this house committed the crime? Naturally. Who? First, tell me where you sent your two friends. Doc and Reggie? Mm-hmm. Ten minutes after we find the corpse with the curly hair here, they go kiting out of the house like men on a mission. The question is, where? Why? They're out scouring the nightclubs and drinking places for your brother. <laughs> Job isn't worth it. Worth what? The trouble you're taking to find him. I want to know where he is and what he's been doing tonight. I want witnesses who will swear that he hasn't been near this house all evening. Why? So that we'll be all set for the police when they start asking questions. When are the police going to start asking questions? As soon as they get here. When will they be here? As soon as I call them. And when are you going to call them? When I'm satisfied. I know as much about this situation here as they'll be able to find out. Aren't you obstructing justice or something? I mean, waiting about notifying them? Maybe. Now then, why do you think this man was killed by someone in the house? Because almost everyone in the house had a reason. Everyone had a reason to want to kill the chauffeur? Was he that important to this house? I hope to tell you. Bob the chauffeur, now Bob the corpse, was putting the screws on the Martins. In what way? Well, let's start at the top of the list and work down. First, Grandma. Blackmail to hush scandal concerning Job and Hope. What sort of scandal? Job and a girl. <laughs> Job hates girls, so I know it was a frame, but it was good enough to make headlines in the paper. Well, what about Hope? Hope can't let chauffeurs alone. Hope, the family wench, was so deeply involved with our new cadaver here that one word from him and the whole world would know what she is. By the way, right this minute, Hope is upstairs asleep in my room. <laughs> oh, a gentleman wouldn't tell. Now, don't be a fool. <laughs> we left her in our room and we heard you scream and rush downstairs. Went up a few minutes ago, she'd crawled into my bed and was fast asleep. Maybe you'd like to explain to her elder sister what she was doing in your room in the first place. She knocked on the door. I opened it and there she stood in a wisp of lace and a pair of black silk stockings. You... You mean the dress this this 
thing was holding in its hands when I found it down here was the dress Hope had been wearing this evening? That's right. Well, that's pretty raw. Oh, no, not as bad as it sounds. They were out together. Wherever they were, a man was killed and blood got on Hope's dress. When she got home, she gave the dress to the chauffeur to ditch. Oh? Well, then... Then he must have been killed as he was going out the front door with a dress. Exactly. From the outside. Yes, he was shot from outside the house. Then that eliminates Hope. Why? <laughs> as fra- flagrant as Hope is, she wouldn't be running about the streets with no dress on. And uh, you said our hero had the dress in his hands when he was killed. Well, that's a pretty thin alibi. She didn't mind coming up and rapping on my door. Besides, she was floating about on pink clouds. Oh, you're crazy. I don't think so. I tell you, you are. Hope hates alcohol. It makes her violently ill. I didn't say she was drunk. She wasn't. No sign of alcohol. But something had given her a fine case of the blind staggers. Something screwy. You you think Hope did this, then? I know she didn't. She was in my room for about 20 minutes, and uh, what you call here hadn't been done five minutes when we got down to him. Then Hope's in the clear? Yes. Wish I could say as much about the rest of the family. You haven't anything on me. I haven't. But the police may have, or can they get it? What do you mean? Simply, if you've got anything up your sleeve, you'd better spill it, so I'll be standing by to give a hand. The police are going to find out everything you wish they wouldn't. So you tell me first, so I can be ready for them. What have you got to gain by all this Boy Scout stuff? I told your grandmother we'd help her out of a mess. This, apparently, is the mess she meant, so talk fast. Well, if I was the murdering kind, Curry Locks here would be my first victim. Why? He talks. And he talks lies. It came to my ears that he had passed the word around among the servants of the neighborhood that the Martin women were pushovers. Is that excuse for murder? Servants don't talk about me like that. Not even if it were true, they don't. But you fire servants, not murder them. Not if the servant has a death hold on the family and you can't get loose. You're referring to his hold on Job and Hope? Uh-huh. He had nothing on you personally? No. Uh-huh. Now then, where were you during the time of the murder? <laughs> I don't know when the murder was. All right, all right. Where were you 15 or 20 minutes before you found the body? I was down in the furnace room. At this time of night? Mm Mm-hmm. Why? Burning some personal letters. Go on. That's all. Just burning some personal letters. You think you can tell the police you were down in the basement at 9 o'clock at night burning personal letters and stop there? If that's all there is. Oh, you're smarter than that. What did those letters have to do with the chauffeur and his sudden demise? What? Why, Nothing. You're not making a very good representation for yourself. I'm not trying to. I'm just telling the truth. But not all the truth. Enough. Very well. You were down burning letters. Then what? I was just coming back up to the main floor when I... when I heard a baby laughing and cooing. Oh, you heard the baby. Yes, what does it mean? Your sister Cherry says every time the baby is heard in this house, tragedy occurs. She certainly hit it on the nose this time. Yes, didn't she? By the way, doesn't it seem a little strange to you that with your screaming when you found the body and all the running about the house that's been done since then, your grandmother and Cherry haven't been aroused? Grandmother and Cherry's rooms are on the third floor. They couldn't hear? No. Well, don't you think your grandmother ought to be told before I call the police? I don't know. I think she shouldn't. Why? Well, after all, she's head of this house. She should have some say as to what the police are told. There's going to be an awful scene when she finds out. Nevertheless, now look, I'm almost finished here. Go up and get her and bring her down. Also, while you're up there, get Hope out of my room and take her to her room. But you haven't asked me about Cherry yet. Well, what about Cherry? I, I mean, whether she might have a reason for, for killing the family leech. Well, has she? No. Great. Now, will you go? And Joe. I know all about Joe, but I need to know for now. Oh, wait, there is one thing about Joe. You say he has a gun with a silencer? Mm-hmm. You know where he keeps it? Yes, in his bureau drawer. Well, while you're upstairs, look and see if it's there. Yes, if, if you think that... I don't think anything. Now, go on. There's something I've got to do, and I don't want you here when I do it. You, you mean Hope's dress? Never mind. What What are you going to do with it? I didn't say I was going to do anything with it. But you are. Well, what you don't know, you can't tell. Now go do the things I've told you to. All right, but hurry. Grandma will be down here two steps at a time the minute she hears. Oh, the furnace is a swell place for Hope's dress. I think they call it destruction of evidence. I'm sorry, old boy, but I need this dress more than you do. Didn't I tell you? What? Oh, it's you. I'm Jerry. Don't you remember me? Why aren't you in bed? They're in my room. Who's in your room? They. Look what they did to me. What do you mean? On my shoulder. Right through my pajamas. But you're bleeding. I know it. You mean someone came in your room and slashed you? Yes. Here, let me see. Uh Exactly like the cut on your arm. Sometimes they'll get tired of frightening me. And then they'll kill me. Didn't I tell you? Didn't you tell me what? That every time the baby cries, something dreadful happens. The baby didn't cry. It laughed. I know. That's because one of our enemies was killed. What do you mean? 
When it's an enemy, the baby laughs. When one of us is in danger, he cries. You're getting just a little wacky on the subject of babies, aren't you? No, it's true. You wait and see. Now, look, Jerry, you go up to my room and wait for me. I'm busy. As soon as I've finished, I'll come up and put a dressing on that cut. I hope the baby doesn't cry anymore tonight. I can't sleep when he cries. If you don't get... Wait, wait a minute. Someone's out on the porch. Why don't you close the door? The body's right in the door. Can't move it until the police come. Hold it. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> My error. I thought this is where I lived. It's Job. Inexcusable. Man must be pretty spiffocated when he walks in the morning and thinks he's home. This is your home, Job. It is. Yes. Oh. What's this cadaver doing blocking up my doorway? He was just killed there. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thought it was a corpse trying to escape from the morgue. Hmm. Shall I step over? If you want to come in, I'm afraid you'll have to. Yeah, give me a hand. I'll help you over. Oh. Nice apartment. <laughs> I think I'm going to like you. There you are. Easy step. <laughs> Not a very wide man. By the way, who are you? Name's Jack Packard. Are you by any chance the murderer? <laughs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> That's good. Nice chap. Hanging's too good for you. Much too good. You think so, huh? Oh, I'm afraid I put it badly. But you know what I mean. <laughs> oh. Oh, Jerry. Hello. Friend of yours? No. Oh, thought maybe he was. Pajamas are such awfully bad taste in the company of a strange man. I'm scared. Poor little terrified mouse. By the way, would it be breach of etiquette for me to ask the name of the visiting corpse? He's your chauffeur. Ah, oh, Bob the Bandit. Well, you seem pleased. Oh, frightfully. Who had the good sense to do it? We thought maybe it was you. Well, that's a tribute. Great tribute. Should have. I never got around to it. A gun with a silencer was used. Consider it murder. No noise. Don't disturb the neighbors. I understand you have such a gun. <laughs> oh, so I have. So I have. Where is it now? Upstairs in my bureau drawer. I hope you're telling the truth, Job. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I am, too. <laughs> Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Duck, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. a few lights, Mrs. Martin. Nobody calls me Mrs. I don't like it. What then? If Randolph Martin isn't good enough for you, call me Grandmother. Everyone else does. Very well. Grandmother Randolph, let's have some lights. Why? Unhealthy ideas grow in darkness. Unhealthy ideas? Murder is an unhealthy idea. What are you talking about? Murder is not in this house. You should know better than that. 
You saw one of its victims carried out of here last night. You, with the rest of your family, spent most of the night explaining your whereabouts to the police. Such a fuss over a chauffeur. Not a very good chauffeur at that. I won't argue that. Furthermore, the police had their gall suspecting that anyone in this house had anything to do with it. On the other hand, it's surprising to me they didn't take the whole family down and lock you up. What are you saying? Mrs. Ma... Grandmother Randolph, you brought my two companions and me here to get your grandchildren out of some kind of a mess. Isn't that true? Yes. You haven't given us the first inkling of what that mess is. If I knew, do you think I'd call for outside help? Well, it should be plain even to you that the murder of the family chauffeur is part of that mess. Nonsense. The police themselves said that he wasn't really a chauffeur, but a member of a confidence ring working here in the motion picture colony. Nevertheless, he was killed in your house while in your employ. By members of a rival gang. Do you know what your chauffeur was doing last night before he came home and got himself shot? No. Yes, you do. If you know that, why do you ask me? You know that he was out with your granddaughter, Hope, and that he was killed less than ten minutes after Hope said goodnight to him when they returned. The police don't know that. No. Neither do they know that your chauffeur killed a man in a drinking joint out at the beach last night. What's that? That he killed the man in the presence of Hope, and that the man fell across their table and bled on Hope's dress. That she gave the dress to the chauffeur to get rid of, and that he still had the dress in his hand when he was shot dead in your front door. How, how do you know this, if the police don't? I've had Doc and Reggie out investigating all night. They just got in half an hour ago. They're up getting some sleep now. But, but why don't the police know? Because the resort where your chauffeur killed his man was a hideout spot for shady characters. Now, don't worry. They'll find out in due time. My granddaughter, Hope, was in a hideout for criminals? Yes. I want to ask her about that myself. Who, who was the man he killed? Now, you can read all about that in the paper. Some gambler. They found his body in one of the canyons out on the way up to Malibu Beach. And, and shortly after he killed this gambler at this place, my chauffeur himself was killed in my doorway. That's right. Then doesn't that prove it was somebody outside, someone revenging himself on the death of the gambler? There's that possibility, of course. You seem very anxious to connect this murder with my family, Mr. Packard. No, I hope you're right. But there are too many suspicious things going on in this house. The center of all the trouble is right here. I'm sure of that. I've noticed nothing suspicious. That's not true. Just got through saying the reason you brought Doc and Reggie and me here was because you were uneasy. What have you noticed? Well, first, your eldest granddaughter, Faye. She talks loud and vulgar and pretends to be vastly amused. But she's frightened. Faye, frightened? Last night, she took some private papers down to the basement and burned them. Why? I don't know. Neither do I, but I intend to find out. Then, Hope. Why did she go to that beach resort last night? Why did she pretend to be drunk when she came home when she was perfectly sober? I don't know. And Cherry... She's been slashed twice and pushed downstairs by someone she's never seen. Why does she talk in that frightened whisper? Who does she mean when she says they are after her? And what does she mean that Hope and her brother Job are in the worst danger? You can leave Cherry out of this. It's a lot of romantic nonsense. Twice slashed and thrown downstairs? You call that romantic nonsense? And the baby. There isn't any baby. I beg your pardon. I've heard it twice now. There isn't any baby, I tell you. Once it cried, and right after that, Cherry was hurled downstairs. Once it laughed and gurgled, and we found the chauffeur shot dead. It's ridiculous on the face of it. Babies don't laugh and cry on a given cue. How would a baby know that Cherry was about to fall downstairs? How would a baby know that my chauffeur was about to be murdered? Cherry says the baby cries when someone in the house is in danger. That it laughs when some enemy of the house is in danger. Cherry's a little fool. And protestations don't change facts. And facts indicate that something pretty vicious, something... Cold and calculating and terribly cruel has been unleashed in this house. You're trying to frighten me. No, I'm not. I'm reporting to you as my employer what I've found. And now let's discuss your grandson, Job, for a moment. Indeed, we will not. Yes, we will. Because Job owns a gun with a silencer on it. And it was a gun with a silencer that killed the chauffeur. Job wasn't even home. So he says. But the gun has disappeared, and the chauffeur was killed with the same caliber gun as the one Job possessed. The police don't know? No, the police don't know this. But I do. And I also know that when Job came home and saw the body in the doorway, he was pretty casual about it. He, he wasn't feeling well. He was intoxicated, I grant you. But even so, he should have been a little surprised and concerned at finding a body lying across the threshold, which he wasn't. I forbid you to talk like that. You can't do that. I can't forbid you to talk? No. But I can most certainly remove you from this house. But you won't. Why not? Because then I'll be forced to turn over all my information to the police. You wouldn't dare. Yes, I would. If we're kept on to solve the murder in our own way, we'll try to protect you in your grandchildren's names. If you make it impossible for us to work on the case, then we'll have to let the police do it. I don't trust you. Well, that depends on what you mean by trust. If no one in this house has committed murder, then we'll cover up for you till the cows come home. If... if it should have been someone here... Then we'll root him out and turn him over to justice. I know it. You can't be trusted. Well, look here. 
Are you trying to tell me that you think someone in this house committed murder and you brought us here to help you cover up for them? No. No, of course not. It well, sounds very much like it. No, all I'm asking you is to be sure. No circumstantial evidence such as the police would use. I, I'm sure none of my grandchildren has done anything wrong, no matter how much it looks it. Oh, that's it. You want them protected from court action and publicity until we've cleared them or proved them guilty? Yes. If they are innocent, and I know they are, to face a charge of murder would ruin us. You have my word. No one will touch them until we know for sure. Thank you. Now then, I've got to talk to Hope and Job. Are they in their rooms? Yes, it was five o'clock this morning before the police left. They're all sleeping. Well, they should be awake by this time. I'm going up. Listen. It's a baby crying. Now maybe you'll believe. But there isn't any baby. Wait a minute. That's the warning. Someone's in danger. Quick, upstairs to the bedroom. Jack! Jack, did you hear that? The, the, the baby. I know it. Come on, Doc. Help me. Look in all the bedrooms. You bet. Whose room's this? That's Faye's room. Don't bother to knock. Hey, what's the idea? Can't a girl go to bed in this house? Nope, she's all right. What's the idea of raiding a girl's bedroom? The baby, someone's in danger. The baby. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Hey, wait for me. This is Joe's room. Doc, run up the third floor and look in Sherry's room. You bet you on the run. Yeah. Well, this is my old friend from the morgue. No, so you're up and dressed. You all right? It never better in my life. Have a little drink. Aren't you ever sober? Didn't you hear that baby crying? I dreamed about a baby last night. Red hair. She was in a French bikini bathing oh, suit. Oh, nuts. And... Is Job all right, is he? Drunk. Which is Hope's room? Th th this way. This this way. It's either got to be Hope or Cherry. Th this room. I... What's that smell? Chloroform. Get those windows open. Look. Look, the pillow's over Hope's face. Get that window open. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Is she dead? Is she dead? No, she's alive. But she, she looks so white. Get out of the way. I'm going to lift her out of bed and take her over that window. What shall I do? Just get out of the way. There. What is it? What's the matter with Hope? Somebody tried to kill her with chloroform. Faith, haven't you an ounce of modesty? Go get something over that nightgown. But, Grandma, they tried to kill Hope. Get something on over that nightgown. Oh, horse feathers. Here, put this blanket around before I smack you. Apparently, my modesty is more important than Hope's life. Now then, Mr. Packett. Forget it. She's going to be all right. What's this nonsense about chloroform? You can use your nose another 15 minutes. You'd have been minus one granddaughter. Here, put this blanket around Hope. What's the matter with you? Your granddaughter near death, and all you can think about is my seeing her in pajamas. I'll keep my granddaughter's modest if this house falls down around my ears. Greetings and salutations, Grandma. Oh, old girl. Joe, go back to your room. What? Miss the fun. Joe, you're in no condition to be here. Go back to your room. <laughs> What's this? Love in our midst. The man from the morgue holding the family wench in his arms. Oh, Joe, you're impossible. <laughs> Hope is almost chloroformed. She's unconscious. Oh, no, not Hope. She's only playing dead. She likes it. Get that drunken fool out of here. <laughs> Please, Joe, come with me. <laughs> Poor, pathetic old grandma. Have a lot of trouble with your family of rats, don't you, Job? Be a good boy. <laughs> All right. Bye bye, man from the morgue. Great old house we live in, isn't it, Grandma? The Martin family at home. Doesn't your brother like Hope? He adores her. She's his favorite sister. <laughs> Funny way of showing it. Nothing. Nothing gets under his skin when he's in that condition. It seems to be all the time. Look, how, how, how is she? I'm better than I hoped for. It'll take her a couple, three hours to sleep off the effects of the chloroform. Now we can put her back in bed now. Uh, one of her feet is bare, so look the other way. <laughs> Grandmother's a little touched on the subject of modesty, isn't she? I think she must bathe in long underwear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll just cover her like that. Jack! Yeah. Jack, look, look what I got. Poor little feather. But, Jerry, what's the matter with her? She's unconscious. This is just like I found her. Now lay her down. Let me see her. <clears throat> look here. Yeah. Clothes doggone near tore off her. Oh, look, look at that bruise on her leg. Uh, here, she's bleeding on the back. Turn her over. Yeah, I know it. There. Oh, what happened? What happened? Hey, Jack, look. She's been slashed again. Yes, three times, right above the hip. Not deep. Like it had been done with a safety razor blade. You Martin girls are certainly unpopular with somebody. Ain't it the truth? Murder sure is on the loose in this man's house. <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, 
comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Listeners, I'd like you to hear a letter from a four-year-old girl. The little girl is a French youngster, and I can tell you that our writer and producer, Carlton E. Morse, knows that it comes from the heart. Perhaps you'd like to tell us why you know Mr. Morse. All right, Mr. Thorson, but I'd like first for Mr. Randall to read the letter just as it was written. How about it, Tony? All right. Dear Papa, I want all the children to be happy for Christmas as I am. Will you please help me get presents for them? Your little Jacqueline. That letter is from Jacqueline Complay, my French foster child. It was after becoming a foster parent that I realized the lack of any happiness and hope which is the heritage of a million war children over there. Please listen while Mr. Thorson tells you what you can do to give these little ones a real Christmas this year. Listeners, start right away to gather toys and discarded but serviceable articles of children's clothing. Then here's what's next. Place them in a carton or wrap in heavy paper. Tie them securely with strong twine. Address them to Foster Parents Plan for War Children Warehouse, 53047th Avenue, Long Island City, New York. That's 530 47th Avenue, Long Island City, New York. Take them to the railway express office nearest you. There will be no cost to you for shipping. Remember to do it now. And remember that you, too, can be a Santa Claus for all of God's children. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, Transcribed. I swear to my grandma, I ain't never seen a screwier set up than this one. Crying. Juicedly interesting, though, isn't it? You mean all these female women are running around in flimsy wisps of lace wanting to be rescued? No, I don't mean female women running around in wisps of lace. <laughs> the thing that bothers me is they ain't no sense to nothing. Well, I imagine these will make plenty of sense once we get on the right track. For instance, what's Jack got us up here patrolling this hall for? But naturally, Doc, after the attempt to kill Hope and Cherry. Yeah, I know, but why is he making everybody stay in his own bedroom? Job over in that room pied, Hope across the hall still sleeping off her chloroform, Faye and Cherry in the next room. Uh, how come he let Cherry go in a Faye anyway? Hmm, because her room's up on the third floor, for one thing. Well, so Grandma Martin's. Yet Jax wants, uh, he went and let her go up there alone. I'm trying. Well, I don't know about that. Yeah, well, we're guarding everybody but Grandma. I wonder why that is. Well, I suppose Jack thinks she's not in any danger. Just the three girls and Job, huh? Another reason for putting Cherry with Faye. Yeah? She's just recovering from this new attack on her. Valley Brutal, if you ask me, and I don't think she's going to be able to take much more of it. Are you talking about Cherry? Yes, that beastly, strained expression on her face. Desperation. She shouldn't be left alone for a moment until this business is settled, in my opinion. Yeah, well, well what do you suppose Jack's doing? I think he's going over the house, room by room. But we already done that, Reggie. Mm, not with any great care. Just made sure there was no one in the house besides those who belong here. Well, what's he expect to find? Well, if someone was in the house long enough to give Hope chloroform and tear Cherry's clothes and slash her, he must have left some clue of his presence. And anybody leave anything around, Jack's the only way to mm, find it. quiet. You know, that's the funny thing about Cherry. Of course, it, it was dark in her room, but even if it was, it's kind of queer that she didn't get some idea of the slasher while she was fighting him off. Mm, too terrifying, I suppose. Mind froze on her. Well, anyway, whether it was a man or a woman... I have an idea it was a woman myself. Yeah? I think Jack does, too. Did you see those scratches on her neck and arm? A man's fingernails aren't ordinarily long enough to do that. Hey, I didn't notice that. Hey, Faye's door's open. Cherry, you little fool, come back here. Now, 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 look here, Cherry. You can't come out here. But I've got to. But you look ill. You should be lying down. I'm all right. She insists that she's got to see Job. I do. I've got to. Now, 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 looky. Jack said that you all got to stay where he put you until he said you could come out. 
Now, he sent us up here to see that you stayed put. But it's important. Besides, Brother Job's so spifflicated, nothing would make sense to him anyway. I don't care. I love him, and he's in danger. Mm, but he can't be in any immediate danger. We've been right outside his door all the time. Oh, I'm going. Well, what you think we ought to do, Reg? Well, look here. Suppose I go hunt up Jack and ask him. Yeah, you do that. But I mustn't no, wait. No, I'll only be a minute or two. When the terrified mouse gets an idea into her head, there isn't much use arguing with her. But it's important. Well, it's going to have to wait until Reggie gets back. Now, look at Cherry. You should get out of them torn clothes. What you still wearing them for? I offered to help her get out of them and put on one of my bathrobes, but try to talk her into anything that makes sense. You ain't sewed in them for the winter, are you? I'm afraid to go up to my room to get anything else. I told you you could have something of mine. No, no. Well, what you scared of your room for? It ain't nobody up there now. Maybe there is. Hey, no, there ain't. We give your room a going over. They, they like my room. They can come any time they want to. You mean there's a secret door or something? No, there's no secret door. Then how the heck can they come to your room any time they want to? I don't know. And I'm getting pretty fed up with these they folks. Who are they anyhow? I don't know. Y- you know, Faye, she just plain don't make sense. Don't look at me. I'm a stranger here myself. Yeah. Hey, look at Jerry. Are they the ones who've got the baby that balls every time something's about to happen? I don't know. I think so. That baby gag gets me down. A house full of widows, spinsters, and neurotics. What's a baby doing here? Well, maybe the stork brought it. Oh, don't be silly. There hasn't been a stork seen in this neighborhood since the year of the big freeze. You know, that's darn funny about this house. Here you are, three of the prettiest girls I ever laid eyes on. And there ain't even one of you got a boyfriend. Hope had one, but he's in the corpse department just at present. You mean that chauffeur? Who else? But, well, that ain't no honest-to-goodness boyfriend like you girls should ought to have. Well, you got everything, Faye. What's the matter with you? I'm immune. That ain't normal. So what? So it ain't normal. Maybe I was born in a refrigerator and never thawed out. What about you, Cherry? I've got to talk to Job. Well, you'll just have to wait till Reggie gets back. Ain't you interested in men? Yes. You are? Well, why ain't you got a feller then? They won't let me. Hey, now, look, that ain't no answer. I don't I don't care who they are. Nobody can keep a girl from having a boyfriend if she wants one. I tell you, they won't let me. Well, why not? They don't want any of us to know a man. They're afraid we'll marry and have children. Terry, what are you talking it's about? It's true. They want the Martin family to end right here. Durned if I don't think you're talking to your hat. Oh, here comes Reggie. Can I go to Job now? Now, hold your horses. Uh, what about it, Reggie? It's all right for her to go in, but first Jack wants her clothes. Hey! Please, Mr. York. Oh, but I say, I, I mean, he positively wants them, wants me to bring them down to him immediately. Well, it's hardly ever done. I mean, just asking a girl for her clothes. Well, if Jack wants them, he's going to get them. Now, uh, go on back in Faye's room, Cherry, and take them off. If I do, then can I see Job? Yep, so so hurry up. Yes, you'll have to put on something of mine. No, I won't. Then how about me going up and getting something for her out of her room? No, but you, you can't do that. But Reggie can. Oh, look here. Now, now go on, Reggie. Sp- uh, p- pajamas and a bathrobe. Anything you can find. Now I'm a ballet lady's maid, and I resent it. <laughs> okay, get inside and just shove things through a crack in the door fast as they come off. All right, here, I'll help you, Cherry. What's the idea, anyway? Probably wants to examine them for clues. Here you are. Okay, a dress. What's he expect to find? Slip. I don't know. Uh-huh. Slip. Here are shoes. Shoes. Stockings. Yeah, stockings. All right. Here you are. Uh-huh. A top doodad. A bottom doodad. Are that all? Isn't that enough? What do you want? Her skin? Oh, did, did you get something, Reggie? There's a whole armful of stuff. She should find something in this. <laughs> yes, she ought to, all right. Here you are, Faye. What? All this? Well, she don't have to put it all on. <laughs> well, that's good of you. All right, get into some of this junk, Miles. Then you can go and see the good-natured drunk. I'd better take these clothes down to Jack. Oh, stick around until she goes across to Job's room. Oh, where is Jack? Down in the library. He's got quite a collection of stuff down there. Such as what? I didn't get much chance to examine it. Things he's picked up around the house. Well, anyway, you don't look quite so bedraggled now. All right, boys, let's go. Hurry. I've waited too long now. Okay. Come on. Uh, You better come along, too, Faye. So you can keep an eye on me? Yeah, something like that. (laughs) Okay, now, Cherry, we'll give you five minutes with him. That's all I want. All right, Job, here's a visitor. Hey. Doc, what is it? Well, well, where, where the heck is he? He's gone. I knew he was. I knew well, it. Well, why the heck didn't you say so then? How'd he get out? Here's how he got out, opened the window, and slid down the drain pipe. Well, that's great. Jack's going to be mighty proud of yeah, us. But look here, why, why would he want to do a thing like that for? Silly question number one. What you mean? 
You didn't think Brother Job would stay put without plenty of liquid refreshment, did you? You mean he sneaked out for a few snorts? But he shouldn't have. He must come back right away. He must. Why must he? They'll get him. They'll get him this time. I know they will. Is that what you wanted to tell him? Yes. I wanted to tell him to stay here where you could watch him. They're just waiting, waiting. Reggie, get downstairs and tell Jack what's happened. Right. Don't leave the girls alone for a minute, Doc. Come on, you two. Get back in Faye's room. Come on, Miles. Why did he go? Because he likes the taste of the stuff. He's breaking Grandma's heart. Well, Grandma broke his spirit. Turnabout's fair play. No, you mustn't say that, Faye. Hey, wait a minute, huh? I want to look in and see if Hope's all right. Uh, you two wait right here by the door so as I can see you all the time. And I don't need either of you move. Yeah, she's all right. Poor little fella. Keep right on her sleeping, honey. She's all right? Yeah, sleeping like a baby. All right, come on back to your room. Say, how much longer you three super sleuths think you're going to keep us undercover? Until Jack says to let you out. Well, I'm getting pretty sick of being a prisoner in my own house. We're just doing it for your own good. It isn't any good locking us up. It ain't, huh? No. When they want to strike, they'll strike whether you're here or not. And what you think we'll be doing all that time? It won't make any difference what you're doing. If you understood, you'd know that. Well, then, why don't you come out and make us understand? You can't. Nobody understands but me. <laughs> She's psychic. I don't know. I just know, that's all. Well, all I gotta say is, if you hadn't told us so much it's come true already, I'd say you were the screwiest screwball dame I ever did see. You wasn't so little and purty along with you. Hey, here comes Reggie back. He's gonna get mighty sick of those stairs if this keeps up. Uh, how about it, Reggie? What's Jack say? Well, he's going out to find Job. While he's gone, he doesn't want us to leave the girls for a second. Oh, stick right with him, huh? Right. I'm to go and sit in my Hope's bed and stay right beside her. And I'm to chaperone Faye and Cherry, huh? Right. Go in Faye's room with them. Don't let either one of them out of your sight. Well, what about Grandma upstairs? Oh, leave her alone. She won't be bothered. It's the girls that are in danger. Oh, no. Hey, hey, what's the matter? He did it. He did it again. Look. Her shoulder. She's been slashed again. Yes, they did it. They did it. Cherry, Cherry, how did it happen? I don't know. I was just standing here. I feel a sting on my shoulder. She's been slashed, all right. Just like the others. But it isn't possible. We were all standing right here. There isn't anyone else. Yes, there is. They were here. They were here. Terry, stop it. They slashed me. They slashed me. <laughs> Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. Reggie, keep changing those cold compresses on Job's head. I want to bring him around as quickly as possible. All right. Shall I let his head hang over the foot of the lounge this way? Yes, that'll bring the blood up where he needs it most. Doggone, fella. You must have popped Brother Job a whopper. I had to. Well, what happened? Well, the minute you told me he'd escaped from his bedroom and slid down the drain pipe, I dropped everything and went after him. But how'd you know where to look, Jack? Where would you look for a thirsty man? The nearest bar. And he was there? Yes, just getting ready to go on to bigger and better things. And you said, come on back, and he wouldn't come, so you floored him. Something like that. You sure all the girls are locked up in their bedrooms so there's no chance of them getting out? Yeah, and I don't mind saying they resent it. They'll just have to resent. Boy, the things Faye said would have skinned them you. <laughs> Living up to a reputation as the family Bulgarian, huh? No fooling. Doggone, no, I hated to take that little old cherry girl back up to her room. She didn't want to go so bad. 
Why do you insist on it? Because I want each girl locked up separately. Uh, Hope still unconscious? She's just sleeping now, I think. <laughs> Seems like Grandma is keeping awful close to her room up on the third floor. She's all right. Jack, you say you want the three girls locked up separately. Why? I want to see what'll happen. You mean if the baby will cry, then one of them gets the business. Yes. But ain't that dangerous? This time, one of them might get killed. How? If they can't get out, how can anyone get into them? You got me, feller. But Cherry insists they can it's just like her getting sliced on the shoulder out yonder in the hall when we was all standing right there. Did you have your eyes on Faye all the time? I say. Hey, you mean... I just asked if you had your eyes on Faye all the time. Well, no, of course not. But what would Faye want to go and slash her sister for? And more than that, uh, Cherry said they did it. All right, they did it. But couldn't Faye be one of them? Job, I'd never thought of that. There's a woman in this someplace. Whoever tore her clothes and slashed her up in her room earlier this afternoon was a woman. Mm, you mean those fingernail scratches on her neck and shoulder? Yes, they were narrow and pointed. Faye's nails are like that. Well, most women's are these days. Doggone, but I'm balled up. About what? About everything. You think maybe Faye shot the chauffeur last night, too? She had the opportunity. But she screamed and brought us down when she found him. Why not? Make it look like she was innocent. Yeah, she could have, all right. Yes, but why would she want to? Well, she may have done it to keep her sister Hope from becoming involved. Or she may have seen him leaving the front door with Hope's dress in her hands and, believing the worst, killed him on the spot. Yeah, but that didn't mean that she was prowling around the house with a gun in her hand. What'd she want to be doing that for? Well, she knew Hope was out with him. She might have gone to Job's room, got his gun with a silencer, and waited for them to come back. Well, we know the gun that killed him had a silencer, all right. And that gun was Job's. You sure about that? Certainly. How many guns with silencers have you seen in your life? Oh, a couple or three. Which means that guns equipped for silence are about as scarce as hen's teeth. All right, I get your point. Well, if Faye is the one, are you going to turn the information over to police? Not yet. I want to know for sure. I talked to the police, and they're sure the chauffeur was a gangster and that he was wiped out by rival gunmen. Let them work on that theory. We'll go on working on this angle. Uh, then then you think for sure what's going on is an inside job. Well, maybe not entirely, but there's someone working on the inside. Finger for the gang on the outside, huh? Something like that. And and it's Faye? Well, certainly her skirts aren't any too clean. But why? What's it all about? You know as much as I do, Doc. They may be trying to frighten Grandma Martin into paying blackmail. She knows something about this she's not telling, that's certain. But that city, why'd she bring us in here to clear up this mess and then hold out information on us? I'm afraid to tell us. Trying to protect someone? How do I know? Yeah. Jack, Job's conscious. What's that? Quiet. Had his eyes open. Closed them again when he saw me looking at him. All right, Job. Oh, what a head. Can you sit up? I don't know. Well, come on, try it. Oh. Say, what'd you hit me for? Because you wanted to argue about coming back, and I didn't have time to argue. It wasn't very friendly. I'm not here to be friendly. You sober? Yeah, I feel terrible. I'm not surprised. I always feel terrible when I'm sober. Like a fish out of water, huh? Look, be a good guy. Now, there's a bottle of brandy in the buffet. Go get it, Reggie. I know. Job. Well? There isn't a doubt in the world your gun killed the chauffeur. Now, where is it? It's gone. I know it's gone. Where to? I don't know. I looked in my bureau drawer for it. It wasn't there. Why do you keep a gun with a silencer? It was a birthday present from Faye. Hey, a birthday present from Faye? Yes. But why would she give you a present like that? I always thought it would be fun to have one, so she got it. Here you are, Jack. No, I'll just take the bottle. On the other hand, you get one drink, that's all. One drink. Maybe after you've talked a while, you can have another. Here. That better? Yeah, a little. Job, did you approve of Hope running around with a family chauffeur? Hope is old enough to vote. Isn't it a fact that your grandmother fired the last four chauffeurs because they were too friendly with Hope? Sure. As the man of the family, what did you think of this? Grandma wears the pants in this family. You had no desire for revenge on them, for dragging your sister down to their level? Look, we got a motto in this house. You mind your business and I'll mind mine. So you were willing to look the other way, no matter what happened to your sister. Oh, let me alone, will you? Another thing. Cherry says you and Hope are in grave danger. Oh, she's always talking. But why did she link you and Hope together? Did it have anything to do with her escapade with the chauffeur? I don't know, I tell you. I don't know what Cherry's talking about nine-tenths of the time. You don't think you're in danger? Sure, I'm in danger. Everybody's in danger. You might get hit by a car or anything might happen. No, I mean specific danger. Oh, nuts. You say that, yet you know that someone tried to chloroform Hope this afternoon. Maybe she tried to commit suicide. How do I know? Well, it's possible. Except that there have been attacks on Cherry, too. Yeah. Somebody scratched her with a pin. Cut, not a scratch. And it was done with something very sharp. Do you use a safety razor? Yeah, but if you think I'm going around cutting up cherry with a safety razor blade, you're crazy. I didn't say that. 
More than that, Cherry was thrown downstairs. And at the same time Hope was chloroformed, she was unconscious and slashed up in her room. Well, nobody's dead, is he? Except the chauffeur and he doesn't count. Why not? I asked why the chauffeur doesn't count. He's not in the family. He was attached to the family. Okay, he was attached to the family. So what? You know, Job, I'm getting the impression that you're getting a great deal of satisfaction out of that murder. How about another nip? No. You don't like Faye, do you? As a brother likes any sister. That's not answering my question. You don't like her, do you? If she was dead, I'd send flowers to the funeral. Oh, look here. Man. That's an ugly thing to say. Well, you asked me, didn't you? This is the first time we've seen you sober since we arrived. I've got a hunch I'd like to see you and Cherry together when you're in this condition. Well, what's that for? Well, you object? Look, don't I feel bad enough now without you bringing that terrified mouse down to whisper about the horrible death that's in store for me? Uh-huh. Yes, I think I'd like to see you and Cherry together. Doc. You want me to go get her? No, I want you and Reggie to stay here with Job and keep that bottle away from him till I get back. You hear that, Job, old kid? I won't be gone but a minute. Say, old chap, you know, you'd be a handsome man if you didn't have such an unhealthy pallor. <laughs> no. How long have you been hitting it up like this? A year, two years, I forget. You like the stuff? In such large quantities, I mean? Oh, now lay off, will you? Fine. Sorry. You don't understand folks like him, Reggie. No? Mm-mm. Folks like him is tickled to death with themselves. That's why they pour it in. Because they like themselves so much they can't stand it. Oh, you're pretty smart, aren't you? They call him the good-natured drunk. But where does his nice disposition go to when he's sober? Look, you two, just leave me alone, will you? Oh, sure, sure. We don't really like to torture dumb animals. Thanks for nothing. What's Packard want to bring Cherry down here for? He has his own reasons. Maybe he wants your little sister to see you when you ain't plastered. Because, uh, Cherry told us she loved you a lot. Yeah, I'll bet she did. Yes, she did. We both heard her. First time I knew Cherry had a sense of humor. She didn't say it like she thought it was funny. All right, stop it, will you? He's gonna bring her down here. Why doesn't he do it? Go away. Go away. It's just me, Cherry. Hello. Who did you think it was? They... They were outside just a minute ago. What's that? Yes, they were. They tried the handle. I saw it moving. And then when they found out it was locked, I heard them whispering. Could you hear what they said? No, just whispering. Men's voices or women's voices? I don't know. Just whispering. Well, you might have been mistaken. No. It was them. They came to get me. Well, I'm here now, so don't worry. I want you to come downstairs to the library with me. Come in my room first. Yes, if you wish. Why did you close the door? Look at me. I am. I'm pretty, aren't I? Very pretty, Cherry. Your face would be beautiful if it wasn't so sad. I'm young. I'm nice. I am, aren't I? I'm sure you are. Then why don't you take me in your arms? Cherry, what is this? Why don't you? Why doesn't anybody? I'm a woman. Yes, I am. I don't think I am. Just give me the chance. Cherry, stop that. Oh. Here, here. You're just all upset. No. Nobody wants me except them. Nobody. They want me. They want me so bad they'll tear down this house to get me. And they will do. If somebody doesn't take me first. I can't do it alone. No. No, not while we're here. Oh, Mr. Packer. Mr. Packard, I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking.